15. Here goes. Three years ago, I found myself living in Geneva, Switzerland. And this was not an entirely happy development for me. Um, I had drugstore French. I could go into the pharmacy and emerge if I really had to, maybe with a roll of toilet paper. Um, although I couldn't do that either because they don't sell toilet paper in pharmacies in, in Switzerland. Um, but that's another story. I had zero IKEA French. So in our household, we went for weeks without things like lamps because my husband, who's a native French speaker, worked twice as many hours as IKEA stores were open in Switzerland. And my restaurant French wasn't really quite up to snuff either. I would go to a restaurant and I'd order a salad and I'd eat it and I'd very neatly put my knife and fork to the side of the plate. And then the waiter would come and look at me and I would say, je suis fini, which I later learned due to my misuse of an auxiliary verb, <laughs> that I had actually been telling the waiters all over Geneva, I am dead, um, <laughs> for month after month. And that was actually kind of how I felt in Geneva, fini, <laughs> done. Um, my husband didn't love living there either, but for him it was kind of like living in a sitcom with wacky neighbors and some kind of lame laugh lines every once in a while. But for me, without any French, it was like living in a silent film. Um, let me back up a little bit. I was probably the world's most unlikely candidate to become an American living in Switzerland with a French man I had met in England. I grew up in a small town in North Carolina. I didn't have a passport until I was 19. I knew one person who spoke a foreign language and um, one member of my entire family, not only nuclear but extended, had ever traveled abroad <laughs> for most of my life. Um, in high school, I studied Spanish. And like many people who study Spanish in high school, I emerged with a grasp of hola and gracias, and crucially, habla inglés. <laughs> we were taught Spanish with the idea that it might help us speak to speak to immigrants at some point in life, but no one ever imagined that we would become immigrants ourselves. <laughs> um, but eventually I did become an immigrant. I moved to London, and exactly three weeks after I landed at Heathrow, I went to a party, and I saw a man standing across the room with kind of, kind of a scowling man with a five o'clock shadow and um, something that made me think, there's a European I'm in Europe. I live in Europe now. I'm going to go talk to that European man. <laughs> so I beelined over there and I stuck my hand out and I said, hi, I'm Lauren, in a way that I now know is probably not how most, most French people introduce themselves. And I said, where are you from? And he said, Bordeaux. And he said, where are you from? And I said, Wilmington. <laughs> and he kind of looked at me and I said, Wilmington, North Carolina. And he looked at me some more and I said, oh, I'm American. I learned that was the right way to answer that question. <laughs> but we got to talking and we didn't really want to stop. And by that time, I had become a little bit more cosmopolitan. I got my passport when I was 19. And by the age of 26 or 27, I was working for The New Yorker. And I remember the pure delight I felt at nestling into the middle seat in the back row of an Alitalia jet for my first international assignment. I thought, I can't believe someone is sending me to Milan, Italy to interview Donatella Versace, the fashion designer. So I landed in Milan the next day and Donatella showed up at my hotel in a black Mercedes with a driver in the front seat. We were to go to Lake Como where the Versace family had a house. So there we are and we're in the back of the Mercedes and it's the middle of August and there's no air conditioning on and Donatella is chain smoking and the windows are up and my mouth starts to water. But I thought, no, it's too improbable. 
And then my mouth watered some more, and I thought, this might really happen. <laughs> and then my mouth watered some more, and I knew it was going to happen. And I raised my hand, and just at the moment, I wanted to say to the driver, sir, please, can you pull over? We shot into a tunnel. <laughs> and it was too late. I vomited on Donatella Versace. <laughs> who, it should be said for the record, was very, very nice about it and kind of fished a little packet of um, travel Kleenex out of her gigantic Versace bag and patted my arm. Anyway, so eventually we arrive at Lake Como and this manservant emerges from the house and thrusts a crystal tumbler in my hand and says, drink this, which I did. And we conducted the interview and we ate pasta, and we talked, and Donatella accepted a call from Elton John during our lunch. And then the interview was over, and we went back, and we were supposed to get in the car and, and return to Milan. And the manservant materialized again, and he said, no, you will go in this van. <laughs> <laughs> Something had come up, <laughs> and Donatella was going to ride back to Milan alone. So it's funny now, but I was absolutely distressed. I thought, here I am on my first international assignment, and I've completely botched it. So I'm in this sad, lonely car on the way home, and I tried calling some friends, and nobody answered. And I tried calling my mother, and she wasn't available. And finally, as a real last resort, <laughs> I call my father at his law practice in Wilmington, North Carolina, and his secretary picks up Hewlett Collins and Allard, and I said, hi, Teresa, it's Lauren, is my dad there? And he gets on the phone and he says, what's going on? And I said, Dad, I vomited on Donatella Versace today. And he said, well, that's all right, honey. If she's one of your friends, I'm sure she'll understand. <laughs> anyway, this is all by way of saying that when, <laughs> when I met Olivier at this party, it had never occurred to me. You know, it was probably the first time I had talked to a French man. Um, and there I was falling in love with him. But as our life together developed, um, you know, we could have these wonderful conversations where we would go exhilaratingly fast or we would go excruciatingly slow, but we just had a hard time finding this kind of intermediate setting, this reliable cruise control in which we could talk to each other. And we'd have these little kind of household, everyday disagreements that would degenerate into linguistic warfare. I would say something like, I'll clean up the kitchen after I finish my dinner. And he would then walk into the kitchen and say, but why did you say you'd clean the kitchen when you have only tidied it? And I would just think, no normal person would ever say that. And it drove him crazy that I would say, my dinner, or I'm reading my book. French people don't really tend to use the possess possessive pronoun there if none is really necessary. And then I'd look at him and I'd say, well, whatever, it's my language. <laughs> or coming from this kind of American school of conflict resolution where I'd been taught that you should put it, you know, put what you want to say on yourself, I would say, um, I want this or I need this. And he took that as evidence of just raging narcissism on my part and that I was telling him what to do. <laughs> so anyway, we started just having a hard time communicating. And one day during, during one of these little, little combats, I would now say, that's the French, French person in me speaking, that we were having, he said to me, talking to you in English feels like touching you with gloves. So it was about that time I knew I was gonna have to learn French. Um, so I signed up for a class, five hours a day for a month, and I got to know a lot about the food preferences and the hobbies of my fellow students. <laughs> the amazing thing about a French class is that it is isolates you with perfect accuracy from anyone who actually speaks French. <laughs> but after a while, the language started to make some sense to me, um, and I started getting the hang of things. And I fell as hard for the language as I had for Olivia. I mean, this is a language that has a word for a person who gets cold easily, frileuse. Or where facing romantic rejection, you can be said to prendre le râteau, to get a rake in your face. <laughs> I love that. And even just simple things like vous and tu. 
started to divide my world differently, to redraw the boundaries between public and private. And so as I started thinking about these things, I thought, you know, I became more and more interested in them in my personal life. And as things do when you're a writer, they spilled in, over into my professional life, and I decided I wanted to know more. And so one of the things I wanted to research was, do we become different people in different languages? I certainly felt like one. And so I look, you know, in French, I mean, it's funny. In English, I'm kind of identifiably like a nice blonde chick from the South. In French, I feel this incredible sense of authority. I say things like formidable and execrable, and the adjectives start to feel like Sasha Fierce to the Beyonce of English. Um, but it turns out scientists have done a lot of research on this too. And the world does look different to people in different languages. Researchers asked speakers of Russian who are obliged to distinguish between light blue and dark blue. So in Russian you can't just say the sky is blue. You have to say it's light blue or it's dark blue. To look, they, they had sh different shades of blue coming up on a screen. And Russian speakers and speakers of different languages had to touch a button saying which shade it was. And the Russian speakers could tell the difference between light blue and dark blue perceptively faster than people who spoke other languages. So the world really does look different. I was talking to a friend one day who grew up speaking Spanish with her mother and father and siblings. She speaks French um, with her husband and her children. And she was speaking in English to me. And she said, I feel really free in English. And I said, well, why do you think that is? And she said, because I'm not anybody's mother or daughter or sister. And for me, is it, no matter how much I assimilate, no matter how much I speak French all day long, I'll never have a childhood in French. So that gives me a different feeling. Um, I live in Paris now. I speak French every day. I was talking to a friend the other day who used the word racli. And I'd never heard it before, and I said, what does that mean? And she said, oh, it's a new slang term. It's kind of like the new muff or nana, which means kind of like chick in English. Um, and I was so excited. So I came home and, of course, wanted to test drive my new word as soon as possible. I walked in the door and I said to Olivier, kind of, I said, you know, bonsoir, ça va, <laughs> racli? I didn't really work it in that well. But he looked at me and he kind of said, what are you talking about? And I said, Rackley, you don't know Rackley? And it was a wonderful moment for me because I realized it wasn't that I didn't know the word because I was foreign. It was that we didn't know the word because we were old. <laughs> um, and we have a daughter who's 18 months. Um, she's, I speak English to her. My husband speaks French to her. And it's completely fascinating to see these two languages taking root in one mind at once. Um, she knows bye-bye, and she knows au revoir. And the other day I walked out the door and she raised her hand and she said, oh, bye, mama. <laughs> which is all to say that the longer that I live in French, which seems to me a place as much as France does, the more I realize that translation has its gains as well as its losses. And the longer I live in French, the more I realize that Olivier and I aren't the sort of linguistic freak show that I thought we were at the beginning, but an exaggerated version of what happens to anybody anytime they fall in love, which is to say we translate not only between languages but inside them, and we all have to learn how to talk to each other. That's it. <laughs>